latest from ABC News, I'm Bill Deal. We'll have to wait another day. The Space Shuttle Challenger's launch to carry the first school teacher into space, along with six crewmates, was postponed a short while ago. We go live to ABC's Vic Rack at the Kennedy Space Center. What a frustrating day. First the bulky front door handle, and then while that was being fixed, clouds and high winds moved back into the area. Winds you can hear in the background that were so strong that NASA, after waiting and waiting and waiting, finally had to throw in the towel, as spokesman Hugh Harris announced. We are in the process of uh, recycling uh, the vehicle back to a safe condition and will be letting the crew out of the orbiter and they will go back to the crew quarters uh, in just a few minutes from now. NASA will try again perhaps tomorrow, perhaps later in the week. Vic Ratner, ABC News at the Kennedy Space Center. And now this. What's the word for the Armed Forces Radio and Television Service? Today's word is scavenger. This word was derived from the Flemish meaning to look at. A scavenger is a bird or animal that feeds on dead flesh. Vultures and buzzards are well-known scavengers. But a scavenger is also a trash picker, a collector of redeemable items. As far back as the 14th century in England, a tax called a scavenge was imposed on traveling merchants who were displaying their goods for sale in direct competition with the local merchants of the cities and towns. To give the local merchants an advantage, a scavenge was levied on the traveling merchants. The officers who collected the scavenge were called scavengers. Not only did these scavengers have to collect the taxes, they were also required to clean the streets of the town. Anyone who collects junk today is referred to as a scavenger. That's the word for the Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Chaplain, the Reverend James David Ford. This time, there was a special message. And at this special moment, let us remember in silent prayer those who were involved in the spacecraft shuttle accident just a few minutes ago all Florida. Let us pray. The House was to have considered a few non-controversial bills, but in deference to the occasion, the House recessed for a few hours. Nor Wolf, Capitol Hill. We are looking at video uh, a replay of the uh, shuttle uh, explosion and uh, what we see uh, it, 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 it is apparent that the shuttle exploded uh, and fragmented from, from that camera angle there's no question about it we saw the, uh, the the plume of smoke but we definitely saw an explosion and then the, the two solid rocket boosters piercing off uh, in different directions following what apparently was an explosion of the Challenger what we saw uh, earlier this morning about the uh, an hour ago now was uh, was the shuttle uh, rising above the uh, the ground high into the sky and suddenly uh, the uh, familiar plume of smoke dividing and spiraling and a uh, sudden realization that uh, that something was dreadfully wrong the astronauts families bob are generally kept together specifically for reasons like this and um, they would have been together uh, perhaps over by uh, crew quarters or the vehicle assembly building uh, for a good view of the launching. And with them, uh, you know, perhaps would have been Krista McAuliffe's uh, husband, Stephen. Uh, Krista's husband was here, her nine-year-old son and her five-year-old daughter. And uh, just uh, here to uh, unfortunately witness a terrible tragedy. The AP's Mark Russo is standing by with us now. This is certainly, uh, without a doubt, the... Uh, the biggest tragedy, the biggest disaster in the American space program, uh, but there have been uh, other hits uh, uh, to this point. Uh, Mark, uh, some background on that. Yeah, Bob. 55 manned space flights and never a death until now in space. But ironically, 
19 years ago, yesterday, three astronauts died on the launch pad during a pressure test of the Apollo spacecraft, the Apollo. Air Force Lieutenant Commander Virgil Gus Grissom, Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Edward White, and Lieutenant Commander Roger Chafee. They died of asphyxiation. That was the official, official notification during a fire on board Apollo, and they died in the first 18 seconds of the fire. Frank Borman, who is now chairman of Eastern, Eastern Airlines, was an astronaut at the time, and he tried to explain to reporters what happened. First basic deficiency was in the... Waiting to hear, first of all, uh, from the paramedics, uh, the crews that have gone into the area of the Atlantic where uh, uh, the, uh, the tracking... Uh, the, where, where NASA tracked the, uh, the object that fell into the Atlantic. And uh, we also are uh, waiting to see if there is any indication from NASA as they play back their telemetry over and over again. They have just a, a, a mound of, of uh, data to go through uh, if they find any indication of what happened. Uh, we can see from uh, video replays uh, that uh, the shuttle indeed exploded it appeared to uh, to fragment uh, suddenly uh, about a minute before it got off the ground or a minute after it got off the ground and uh n now there is just a just a trace of uh in the sky of of uh, uh the, the remains of that uh, plume of steam that uh, that lifted the shuttle high into the sky uh the ap stick Juliano is uh joining us again he's been uh, tracking down some some information what he can find out about this didn't have to track uh, very far bob we don't have any firm information at this point as to what happened but and with the time now at nine o'clock on victory we cross to the news desk and penny guy Fragments from the Space Shuttle Challenger have been sighted by crisscrossing planes, ships and helicopters in the Atlantic off the Florida coast. So far, the wreckage seen measures from 10 to 15 feet in length, but it won't be recovered until first light in the area. Britain's astronauts have sent a telex to NASA expressing their deepest sympathy, and ironically, it was a gospel that they completed a course on how to rescue victims of a blazing fireball. A man has now been charged with the murder of a 23-year-old mother at her home in Bitter...
That was our weekly program, Muhammad, the Light of Islam. And it came to you from Radio Kuwait. From Radio Kuwait, we present In the Groove. Hi there, and a big welcome to the 30-minute roundup of chart happenings from the past. And let's get this show off to a real good start with this one from Starship called We Built This City. Postal correspondent Kevin Ray, explains how the commission set up by the Polish government is handling the crisis. By yesterday afternoon, the commission says, experts have detected an increase in the intensity of radioactive iodine in the atmosphere. It could be damaging to health, it says, if it were to last a long time. But in view of its transitory nature, it presents no danger. However, the commission adds that the radioactive iodine could be harmful to infants, older children, and pregnant women. It could enter the body through plants or milk. The commission has therefore recommended a halt to the consumption of milk from cows fed on green fodder. Only milk from cows fed on dry fodder will be on sale to the public. As a precaution, children in northeastern Poland and also in Warsaw are to be given a dose of an iodine preparation to protect them against absorbing radioactive iodine. The Ministry of Health has reminded the public of the need to wash all spring vegetables before eating them. This is the fullest report on the effects and dangers of the Soviet nuclear accident to come out in Poland so far. From the start, the authorities have adopted a tone of reassurance. But in Warsaw last night, people were already reporting a rush to buy up dried milk and other safe food. Eleven British students on a language course in Minsk, about 200 miles north of the nuclear site, are cutting short their stay and returning to Britain. The eleven from Manchester University will fly home from Moscow. In Kiev, about 70 miles south of the power station, a language student from Liverpool Polytechnic said that she and her fellow students were very worried and wanted to return home, but the British Embassy in Moscow had said they must pay their own fares. Miss Christine Folder, one of about 70 British nationals in Kiev, said on the telephone this morning that the embassy was offering them no advice. This was because the Soviet authorities were saying that Kiev was a safe city. In other parts of Europe, the wind patterns this morning are being studied with special care by the weathermen. Radiation levels over Scandinavia, which rose sharply on Monday and Tuesday, are now said to be declining, with the winds changing direction and blowing the dust, dust back towards the Soviet Union. Mrs. Thatcher and the Environment Secretary, Mr. Kenneth Baker, told the Commons yesterday that no increase in the levels of radioactivity had been detected in Britain since the Soviet disaster. But scientists as far away as Japan are predicting that the contamination will reach the Far East over the next few days. Briefly, this morning's other news. Soviet government, 
An accident has occurred at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, 130 kilometers north of Kiev. Two people died in the accident. According to preliminary estimates, the accident occurred in one of the blocks of the fourth power unit, as a result of which some of the constructions of the reactor building were destroyed and a radiation leak ensued. The three other power units were stopped. They are in working order and are on standby. A government commission is working at the site of the accident. Listeners, here we come to the end of our news summary presented to you from the Radio Baghdad, the broadcasting service of the Iraqi Republic. And that, dear listeners, brings us to the end of our daily program in English. Presented to you from Radio Baghdad, the broadcasting service of the Iraqi Republic. On a short wave, 41 meter band equal to 7170 kilohertz from 1 double to 3 double Baghdad local time. To our listeners in Europe from 22 double to 24 double GMT. For our listeners in North and South America, our English transmission will be on a short wave. 31 meter band equal to 95.65 kilohertz and on a short wave 25 meter band equal to 11,750 kilohertz from 7 double O to 9 double O bag at local time or 4 double O. Voice of Sweet China. Please stay tuned for the commentary read by Albert Sun. Tonight's topic is the $30 billion problem. The Republic of China's foreign exchange reserves surpassed the $30 billion mark last week, making the country the world's fourth largest foreign policy holder after Western Germany, the United States, and Japan. If the rate of increase continues, which is very likely, the ROC's next act would approximate the 40 billion. To the following questions. Question number one. Who will make up the English staff of the Voice of Free China? And question number two. What are the names of the programs each of them hosts? To make it even simpler or easier for you, you can refer to our program schedule. Again, the questions are one. Who will make up the English staff of the Voice of Free China? And two, what are the names of the programs each of them hosts? You see, the answers are right at your fingertips. How's that? So, why don't you take a pen and rush your answers to Voice of Free China, PO Box 24-38, 24-38, Taipei, Taiwan, the Republic of China. Please remember our deadline is end of June. And don't forget to mark contest on the envelope. Who knows? Maybe you might win yourself something you have always dreamed of from the Republic of China. Now it's 12.45 Greenwich Mean Time. It is Chris Chaplin with Sports Roundup.